Welcome to Beyond Well with Sheila Hamilton. Testing one, two, three, four. And welcome to 2020. There we go. 2019 was our first year. This could get just so much fun. And we invited in some amazing guests. Let's get a a level on. We had some amazing topics. I know. I I want that story. (laughs) And we'd like to thank you for supporting the show. Yeah. So we thought it might be fun before we dive headlong into the new year. All right, everybody's level looks good, right? To take a quick look back okay. at a few of our faves from 2019. Three, two, one. This episode of Beyond Well is from March 2019. It features in studio author Lydia Yuknovich. Beyond Well looks back. Hey, this is Sheila Hamilton, host of Beyond Well. This podcast is for people who want to learn more about the interior of our lives. I've wanted to host a show for a long time where people could feel less alone in dealing with the things that we all face from time to time. Every one of us is on a spectrum of mental health from feeling pretty good to feeling really awful. And we need to stop pretending the hard times don't exist or that the hardest parts of being human is something that we need to be ashamed of. We take one topic at a time, and today we're going to dive deep into depression. And I promise two things if you hang on. You're going to come away with some new ideas about how to cope, and you'll hopefully gain a new way of thinking. Every week, I have two good friends here, Dr. Jenna Lejeune. Hi, Jenna. Good morning. And Dr. Brian Goff. Good morning. And every week, I like to bring in someone whom I love. And this week, my heart is beating so fast because it's Lydia Yuknovich. She's the author of nine books including The Chronicle of Water, The Small Backs of Children, The Book of Joan, which has been optioned for a film by Kristen Stewart. Is that right? Correct. Oh, scary. Wow. (laughs) And exciting. (laughs) And The Misfits Manifesto. Lydia is also the founder of a literary hub that helps nurture new stories from diverse storytellers. Lydia's TED Talk, The Beauty of Being a Misfit, has been viewed 2,682,000 times. And it's the first time since I've been watching Ted, that I felt like someone was sending me a code in her message. We are not the stories they make of us. Although it didn't happen the day that dream letter came through my mailbox, I did write a memoir called The Chronology of Water. In it are the stories of how many times I've had to reinvent a self from the ruins of my choices. The stories of how my seeming failures were really just weird-ass portals to something beautiful. All I had to do was give voice to the story. There's a myth in most cultures about following your dreams. It's called the hero's journey. But I prefer a different myth that's slightly to the side of that or underneath it. It's called the misfits myth. And it goes like this, even at the moment of your failure, right then, you are beautiful. You don't know it yet, but you have the ability to reinvent yourself endlessly. That's your beauty. You can be a drunk, you can be a survivor of abuse, you can be an ex-con, you can be a homeless person, you can lose all your money or your job or your husband or your wife, or the worst thing of all, a child. You can even lose your marbles. You can be standing dead center in the middle of your failure, and still, I'm only here to tell you, you are so beautiful, your story deserves to be heard, because you, you rare and phenomenal misfit, you new species, are the only one in the room who can tell the story the way only you would. To me, that makes me cry again, because I think of someone like myself who, on the day that I actually first watched that TED Talk, was really in a state of panic and anxiety and felt like I was a massive failure. And the fact that your words made me feel like I had an ally in the struggle was something else. I'm so glad to hear that. It makes it worth it that I almost died trying to do it. (laughs) I want to hear more about why you almost died. What happened? I'm a very shy person. By nature, I'm an introvert person, and I knew all along that there was a possibility I might die on the stage (laughs) trying to do something that uh, public or large. Um, And as we've 
spoken of earlier, I think the dress and the boots probably held me up and saved me. Because <laughs> um, I was definitely in an altered state um, and scared, witless. Uh, and my husband was in the audience, so I also thought, well, if I do die, he can come up and kind of gently pick me up off the stage <laughs> and put me somewhere. Lydia, when I read the chronology of water, I had never experienced someone speak about violence, sex abuse, uh, the trauma of growing up being really in that kind of of hysteria almost daily and come away feeling like suffering isn't beautiful, but you're going to get through it. Mm-hmm. When, at what point in your life did you become conscious enough to to be able to use writing as your way out of what you were experiencing? It likely began in a process of reading literature where I would recognize little bits of self. I remember the first time I read Adrian Rich's poem, Diving Into the Wreck, which is about finding a wrecked ship at the bottom of the ocean but to me the poem was about how sometimes you go to the bottom of the ocean in your life Hmm. and you have to make choices about whether or not you're going to come back up or what's down there and so it was reading that brought me to little glimpses of self that I could bear to look at and the writing part came out of me under duress and trauma during a time when I was Incredibly sad after the death of my daughter, I spent some years living under an overpass and scribbles in a notebook came out of me that were kind of mumbo jumbo. Wow. (laughs) Um, But later when I looked at those same scribbles after I'd gotten help and kind of re-entered society, there were these little stories of girls who didn't die embedded in them little tiny stories like this long Mm. of girls with their hair on fire Mm. or girls who put their arms back on with Mm. tape wow um and when i could see those stories i started writing this quote um suffering isn't beautiful nor is it a state of grace but you can swim to the wreckage at the bottom and bring something back to the surface that can help others i wish that i had heard that quote earlier so that I could not spend so much time at the bottom. Right. But, um, and so it's what I want to talk about today is the process that you used even under the underpass in recognizing writing is something that can bring me back to myself. Recognizing my body is something that I can, can bring me back to myself. And in the writing classes that you give at Corporeal, I was always so struck by this um, statement when you would say, Sheila, when you're stuck, come back to your body. Come back to how you're breathing, how you're sweating, what your fingernails feel like, how dry and brittle they are today. Um, And what is the point of an instructor who says that to a student? What does coming back to the body do? Well, two things. Uh, I actually believe that storytelling is medicine for life. I don't mean it in a smarmy way. I mean it in a can save your life way, that when we can conjure stories about how to live and who we are, we can stay alive and keep going. The body piece is that everyone everywhere is carrying their entire life experience in or on their body, and it's written there. And there are places on your body that are holding different experiences, literally. Like if I write about a boob, Something's going to come out about my life, some story I've been holding there that I haven't told anyone, just waiting for voice and the right time to be expressed in a way that can reflect something useful back to me. So I actually think of bodies as story holders, Hmm. and it's how we keep from flying apart, usually in times of duress or grief or pain. You know, it's fascinating for me about it, and please jump in whenever you guys feel like you um, want to, but... In order for me to sort of calm down after the traumas that I've experienced in my life, and sadly, um, I've had a few, (laughs) it's that um, mindfulness was incredibly helpful because it does the same thing. It actually forced me 
to know where my feet were, to understand where my breath was coming from, to be able to actually come back to my body in order to calm my brain. Do you both use yeah. that in your practice? Yeah. Well, in hearing this, the thing that shows up for me is this idea that in my head, I can go anywhere at any time. I, I mean, our minds are these teleporters and time travelers. I can go to last year uh, at the best part of the year, or I can go to last month, the worst part. Uh, and sometimes I don't really feel like, and, and I think other people experience this, that I'm a teleporter and trance and, and time traveler without a rudder. <laughs> I, I wind up in places and at times that I don't want to be. But something about our senses, something about being in our bodies is right here, right now. I can only breathe this breath. I can remember feeling hungry mm. yesterday, but I can't actually feel yesterday's hunger. And there's something grounding and out of my head by returning to a sensation of my fingernail or yeah. uh, what it feels like inside of my shoe right now uh, where the pressure is on my various toes or how my breath feels. Is it cooler or warmer as the air comes in and out? Um, or this cold that I'm wrestling with is <laughs> very here and now. You know what I love about having you on while you have such a cold? It's so human. <laughs> oh, it's the, it, it, there's so many human things. I actually, <laughs> I had this thought like cold medicine, they actually, I won't name the cold medicine that I took this morning in case they want to be a sponsor, uh, but they intend for it to taste like that. Like, oh God, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Rough. Jenna, you were, uh, you were talking about how important it is for people who w want to go into real therapy to understand the stories that they're telling themselves. Talk about that, if you would. Yeah, I think, you know, stories and words in particular, they can be so incredibly beautiful and they can be incredibly limiting for us. So, like... Brian was saying words have this ability, like, like, and only human animals get to do this, as far as we know, have this amazing ability to, if we have the talent like you, bring this past that you had and pull it into the future and kind of bring life to it again and be able to see it from these different sides mm -hmm. and perspectives mm -hmm. that you didn't get to see when you were young. It's an amazing ability. And... At the same time, because we have such this powerful organ of the mind, we can get trapped inside very, very limited stories like I'm only an addict or I'm only, a, you know, whatever the, the label is going to be. And so the trick is how do you start pulling out all of these little stories like I, that is such a beautiful image of going down into the into the wreckage and kind of pulling things out of it how can you bring those to the surface to the now mm -hmm. which is where the body is how do you bring those out now so that you can kind of look at them all together and it makes this complex beautiful rich picture um so i think that's one of the ways that I work with stories or words in therapy is helping people see them from different perspectives. Realistically, if you have grown up in uh, a family structure like Lydia did, where there was a lot of, not very much safety at all, mm -hmm. and she reverted into a place to, to claim her own safety, mm -hmm. I, I would think that being creative enough to say, well, that's not the story that you're going to make of me isn't something that a child gets to do very easily. No, what you do if you're in Lydia's spot is exactly what Lydia did. Like you figured it out mm -hmm. to get you to the place where you are now that then you could re kind of re-put those pieces of the story together or take a look at them in a way that, of course you can't when you're a kid and you're in that spot. Um so yeah, hopefully you figure out and have, you know, the whatever it is, grace or resources to help save you during that time. Yeah. And then you get to have this time in your life. Right. 
One thing that you've uh, written about so beautifully, Lydia, and I still see it in so many of your gorgeous posts is how you return to the water as almost like a different being that you are kind of, I think of you as a mermaid. Well, look at your braid. I mean, (laughs) you are a mermaid, just so beautiful. But the water was one thing that just saved you. Does it continue to have that effect on you? Absolutely. I mean, when I was a child, I was a competitive swimmer starting Mm -hmm. at age like six And you're right, I didn't have the consciousness or capability to articulate what was wrong and invent a way to, but I was really strong. And every moment I was away from the dreaded Oedipal house in the swimming pool was uh, another day of saving my own life. And Mm -hmm. even though I couldn't have articulated like this as a child, I think... You know, I was changing the story from I'm drowning to I can swim several miles and my father never learned to swim. (sighs) And so, you know what I mean? I think even as a kid, we change the stories Mm -hmm. just because that's when we have the most phenomenal imaginations. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't have said, I'm changing the story. Right, exactly. (laughs) my life. Right. Mm -hmm. But, But that that bandwidth of imagination that children who survive and endure have is a storytelling, you know, superpower. That's right. Mm-hmm. I um, I was shocked when I learned that other kids actually grew up in households where there was a lot of emotional clarity and people got to be sad and cry and they got to be really joyful. And because we all grow up in our little silos yeah, of what life right. is supposed to look like, we don't have any sense that other people are learning how to be full emotional human beings. We're just coping in our own small <coughs> little way. And I suppose as long as you get to survive it, that's an okay method, correct? I, yeah. And I think what you're sort of saying there, Sheila, is if you take that out kind of broader, you didn't know the other perspectives of all those other kids growing up. And if you think about just within yourself, you were only seeing it from like that one perspective. And now you get to go back and see your own story from all these different perspectives. It's not a different story. Mm, It's just you're getting to see it from all these different perspectives, and that is the beauty of it. everything. Yeah, Yeah. And it doesn't doesn't necessarily change the story that you're carrying around predominantly, but it it lets you in on the idea that this way that I'm feeling this and this way that I'm experiencing it is but one way to experience exactly. this. Right. And I don't have to change the facts of the story. I can shift the time. I can shift the actor. You know, I can sort of move things around. I heard this story of somebody who hated flying and was just like, you know, white knuckling and waiting for like the drinks to come so they could pound back a few of those little single servings to make it. And them telling themselves like, the plane's not going to crash. The plane's not going to crash. The plane's not going to crash. And then they had this epiphany, like, what if I look around the plane and I and I see this kid behind me who's, you know, eight years old and looking out the window with wonder in his eyes and just say, what's his experience of this plane right now? And it's like, oh, my God, we're flying. We're in the air. This is amazing. <laughs> and everything looks super familiar because this is my home, but I don't see it from 10,000 feet. So it's all like brand new. And then it's like, what's the co-pilot thinking? And it's like maybe plain Sudoku, maybe it's like driving a bus, maybe bored, you know, who knows, right? And it doesn't mean that being terrified that the wings are going to fall off is gone and that I'm stupid for feeling that way. It's this is but one way to experience this plane and this plane is full of different stories of what it's like to be on this plane. And that's the thing about what the where you were when you were growing up there, Sheila. It's not that being able to throw temper tantrums is a good thing. Right. But it's being able to have your whole range of experience yeah. and your range of experience includes profoundly sad and tragic times. Right. Yeah. So what do we do mm-hmm. when we all become aware of the stakes? Like I'm having more fear in my life now probably than I've ever had before because I've had loss. I've had a lot of things go wrong. And those are the things that are combining to make me say no. Part of the problem is that stakes, it also means you have things you care more about. I mean, that's the nature of stakes, right? So yeah. it's sort of like what you care about most is directly tied to how much 
pain you're going to experience. And so you could try and get rid of the the pain. You can do lots of things. Lydia, you talked about lots of things you tried to do to get rid of the pain. I've done, I continue to do lots of things to try and get rid of the pain. And what happens is then the stakes go down and the things you care about go down and your life gets really, really small. And that's actually what I would probably call depression. You know, when I think about depression, depression isn't feeling intensely sad. Depression is the result of not being able to feel whatever it is that you were feeling. It's the result of shrink your life shrinking away mm. from all of those feelings. Mm. And it's a choice you have, you know, but that's what I think depression is. Lydia, you write so beautifully and honestly um, when you struggle, as I, I try to do too, because I want to normalize the experience for people and just remind people there's a lot of us who go through these periods where you're just not at your best. And it seemed to me that um, summer hurts you more in your psyche than any other season. So would you call what you struggle with a seasonal affective disorder? Well, nobody wants me to because everyone loves the sun. <laughs> and my son and I love the gray, rainy, you know, we're giddy when it's gray and rainy. And it's I've so noticed, much more romantic. I know. I noticed we're go. definitely in the minority. <laughs> or, or would you say it's, it would be considered clinical depression when you actually go through those periods? I suspect it's rooted in life experiences and not so much the season. Although, when I was growing up as a kid, I fainted in the sun a lot with the blue eyes and the blonde hair. I, I wasn't good at it, yeah. at being in the sun. So I would faint, and a couple of kind of terrible things happened to me with my father in that August period. Oh, no kidding. So I have emotional trauma there. Yeah. And, and so I think all the things combined, the external things and the internal things. Yeah. Um, August was also a time, I was in academia for 30 years before I retired recently. And August is the dread of having to start the new term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. I love fall. It's man. my favorite time yeah. of year. But that, that strange setting mm -hmm. up for, you know, the slog of labor so I think it's all those things oh, together. Uh, boy, you're speaking to me so with so much intensity because my husband died in um, December, but he left or went to a psychiatric area in October. Uh, Sophie was diagnosed with leukemia in October. Mm -hmm. it, I remember. And, and you know what's, uh, I, I'm probably going to lose it here, but I used to love the change of colors. And now it's like a reminder mm -hmm. Yeah. how the body holds this trauma. Yep. It's yeah. like, you're going to have to remember this again. You're yeah. going to have to look at the way the light is falling. You're going to have to look yeah. at these colors right. and you're going to have to mm -hmm. remember this. And I've tried really hard to start to relate to nature in that way of, yeah, everything has the seasonality, as does our trauma. It goes through a really intense period and then it can die and it can also be reborn in a completely different way. I say that in my mind, and also I know that <laughs> I'm going to go through it every yeah. single yeah. fall. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. get out. No, I'm sure you've had this experience, Jenna, with clients that, that, you know, we have these, we were just talking about stories, right? And they have little elements in them that are by themselves pretty benign, but they're associated with this painful narrative. And then that, little bit shows up it could be oh yeah well the change of temperature or yeah. the the change of the the leaves and the color on the trees Sheila and what you were thinking about when you were walking in you know the fall colors when your daughter was diagnosed right um or it's like oh that's the season where I put on that sweater oh god I know what happened when I wore that sweater and then the story comes back the whole narrative there is a, a way, I, I think, you know, this is um, the, the body keeps score. I'm sure that mm -hmm. you guys have, have talked about that, that if we really begin to 
allow ourselves to actually go p- through that period. I mean, one of the things that helped me was rather than thinking, oh, I, I have to do more yoga and I have to I take more walks and I have to be on a clean green diet was actually just to go, oh, you know what? I'll probably be sleeping more. Uh, I want, need mm-hmm. to take care of myself in terms of allowing myself times to cry during this time. And thinking about this process as, oh, this is going to be the tough period. Go ahead and feel it a little. Yeah. It la- it lasts less if I allow myself to do that. Agreed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I for myself, I'm a tiny bit better. Yeah. <laughs> maybe when I'm 97, I'll have licked this. <laughs> um, but I've stopped trying to... Uh, fix it or cure it and I've started trying to understand how to move through it differently mm. which is exactly what you're saying mm. and it yeah. it it's shorter yeah what are some of the things that you can do um, other than just allowing the grief to come up what do you do that works well of course swimming because I'm just better in water y'all just have to trust me <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is the hard part being in the air on the ground yeah with uh-huh. the people's so always swimming, um, I've been meditating for about 20 years now, and that has helped me tremendously. Yeah, Painting, and big painting, like where you have to step up to it with your whole body. I'm not any good, so don't hear me wrong. <laughs> uh, but the action of, of expression and color and art with a very big canvas, wow. for some reason, has helped me in summer. Yeah, I don't even have some magical understanding of why. Except it's very physical. It's not analytical. I'm not mm-hmm. deeply thinking about my woe. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to move back and forth as a body with this. It's like if writing could be a room, it it feels mm-hmm. more like I'm getting into a form of expression where I can step up to it and it's as big as me or bigger. Wow. It's pretty cool. That's so. Uh, that's such a beautiful image too. Because if I had my way with writing, every page would be life size, no, so too. that I could move the words around and actually see it on a huge screen. Me too. I I highly encourage you to choose a wall of your living space for that, and for the paint. What a beautiful idea! Yeah, I love that, mm-hmm. Lydia. You were talking about swimming and. I'm not a swimmer, but um, although I do love swimming, so maybe I'll call myself a swimmer. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll be limited yeah. by that story. <laughs> Absolutely. I was swimming before I was walking, so sure, I'm a swimmer. Um, but a lot of people talk about swimming as being very meditative of this, like, you have this physical sensation of this, like, softness going over your body and you're you're moving through this liquid in this way. Is that also sort of a meditative practice Absolutely. for you? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh-huh. I mean, I know a lot of people are... And I work with a lot of people who are afraid of water or Mm -hmm. have trauma there, and Mm -hmm. I try to help them have less fear and trauma. Uh, But for a person who does inhabit the water with love and ease, uh, the repetitive motion, I'm sure, has something to do with the Zen quality of it. And I'm old now, so the competitive swimmer, Lydia, has receded mostly, (laughs) unless there's a 15-year-old next to me. (laughs) 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 <laughs> they can't drive my car home. Like, my arms. But totally worth it. Just school down totally to senior totally. Totally. So yeah. awesome. Stick it to them. <laughs> Mostly. It's, it's the water, the floating, the non-weight bearingness, yeah. mm-hmm. the repetitive motion mm-hmm. um, can bring me quickly to uh, it's going to be okay. Yeah. 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 You know, one of the things that you mentioned, Lydia, just a few minutes ago... It, the word struggle or actually the absence of it is what keeps coming back in my mind. It's this idea you said, you know, I'm not trying to get rid of the feelings that I'm having. I just move through it differently. Mm -hmm. And I, and the words carry it differently. And, and the thing that I noticed when I watched your Ted talk was it, it was so honest, brutally. So at times, but the absence of struggle, just the, like, like there's no fighting it. And, It popped up in my head, Sheila, when you were saying, okay, well, this is my rough time of year, so I've got to ramp up Mm -hmm. this and i got to ramp up that. As though though we don't go through rhythms and and patterns and, you know, seasons. Everything else on earth goes through seasons, but we fight that. Yeah. Right. Uh, And it just, it feels like 
if we can just be a little bit more open to whatever that experience is, we carry it differently. Yeah. And if we fight it, God, it just seems like the thing that we fight is the thing that we're damned to have. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think the biggest breakthrough for me was that I was at a therapist and I said, so I'm doing meditation and then I go on a walk and here's what I'm doing in terms of my diet and here's what I'm doing. And she was like, you know, have you ever thought about like taking an antidepressant? I have. And I said, wasn't the antidepressant that caught my attention? It was her saying, I have. I, have. I experienced this. I go through the, these kind of depressive periods and here's what I do. And I didn't, I, I was so fascinated that a therapist, a person with all of this knowledge and all of these doctors behind them would say to me, here's how I suffer. Because that, that her admission, her joining me in, in this human experience was all I needed to hear. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's the I have no relationship to those words at all. No, Everybody every single one. I am. Every single one of my clients knows that we are all in the soup together, me included. Yeah, yeah. That's you know that's sort of like the big joke on everybody. It's sort of like you come into therapy, you come in to see me, you know, Doctor Lejeune, as if you're broken. And you're the sick one, and I have some answer that you don't have, and I'm I'm the like cured one in some way, and it's like, or we're both human, and this is a condition of the human mind. Like this is just how human minds work. Just like there are seasons in nature, there are seasons for the human mind as well. But one of the difficulties is we get so locked into. This is exactly how it is all of the time when we're in these depressive places and that ability to take a step back. And it's really hard to do, but you can develop lots of practices that can help you do it. Be able to take a step back and see the whole pattern and not just this, I can't get out of this blackness that I'm in right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But this is so different than the dominant story. Oh, of course. Because the dominant story is... You know, if you are sad or you are anxious mm -hmm. or you're losing hair mm -hmm. or you can't keep an erection or whatever, there's a pill for it. We'll make that go away. Right. And it's mm -hmm. all about figuring out how to struggle more effectively. Right. And what we're talking about here, all four of us are talking about like putting down the rope. Yeah. Like yeah. stop pulling so hard. Stop the struggle. Mm -hmm. Lydia and I have been talking about this because in our society, women over 50 are asked to sort of disappear and um, <laughs> we're both over yeah. 50 and we've decided not to disappear. And I think that aging is also going to be one of these categories, just like the other things that people suffer with where, Absolutely. where it, there's going to be like, I just read yesterday, the pharmaceutical companies are coming up with a pill for loneliness. The very human urge of loneliness which is, is is attempting to say to us find human connection they're going to find a pill so that you don't feel that either yeah and it worries me it worries me how much our society has just been placated with another drug on top of another drug on top of another drug and it's a it's really in my own experience what prompted my late husband to say there was no hope for him because even after 13 drugs in his body, he still just felt like an elephant being um, experimented upon. He didn't feel human. Yeah. I think the loneliness pill thing is such a beautiful example. Like, let's pretend that that could work. Let's pretend that you could take something and you'd never feel lonely again. You know, the cost of that you don't care about having relationship with people. Right, like, right, right. Do you want to make that cost? And I was thinking about Sophie, what you yeah. said. Like, maybe, maybe if you, I mean, I don't actually think it's possible, but I don't know. You might be better at this than me. Maybe if you worked really hard and did the best yoga ever, maybe when October comes around, you're not going to have that feeling of sadness and grief over recognizing that this is the time when your beloved daughter got diagnosed. Yeah. And then you know what the cost of that is? Don't care so much about your beloved daughter. Yeah. Because they go together, right? Yeah. And so when we think about, even if it were possible to stop having any of the suffering, yeah. 
you'd stop having anything that you cared about. And it is not to say that there's something beautiful about, like, I do all sorts of things to get rid of my suffering. That's right. But I also want to pay attention to what's the cost that I'm paying to get rid of the suffering. And sometimes it's not worth it. Mm. You can get lost in the the abyss, but, yeah, you only hurt about the things that you care about. Yeah. And sometimes I'm most aware of the stuff that I care about because I hurt over it. Lydia, I want to... talk to you a little bit about your willingness to take on violence against women, the, the small backs of children. That's the one. Yeah. That, um, and the book it's of in all of them. <laughs> it's in all of them. It is in all of them. Um, I think one of the reasons you're so popular with young writers, especially young female writers is because they, they see a different path for themselves in the characters that you draw. Would you talk about that a little? It's re- in, deeply related to what we're talking about right now because I try and make girl characters and women characters and men characters and non-gender conforming characters who are changing the script Mm -hmm. or the story. Mm -hmm. And so Small Backs of Children has a little girl in a terrible war zone with terrible, the most violent things happening to her. her. And the storyline is that she has to figure out how to save herself. Mm Mm-hmm. And she becomes an artist, which is a biographical truth for me, how I saved myself uh, by finding self-expression rather than self-destruction. Mm. So to make characters who break the story we've been told or the storylines that are making us stuck or feeling dead or mm-hmm. so victimized we can't move, to restory. Uh, that same character or yourself with a new plot line (laughs) where where you move differently inside the story. And so fiction writing has been, I I would call it like swimming. Mm. Fiction writing has shown me that anything that is a story can be de-storied and Mm re-storied. And it just takes practice. Yeah, Mm. Just like painting or swimming or anything. Um, part of what you've just described is so interesting to me in that um, the way victim culture kind of pisses me off in a bit is that it doesn't allow people to see their own strength or their own way out. And I was thinking about um, after Sophie was diagnosed, she went to a party and she said, mom, it is so awful to walk into a party now because the men in particular look at me with so much disgusting pity on their face. They're not aware that I'm going to graduate from Stanford in four years with a master. They could care less that I just ran six miles this morning. They know nothing about my story, but they're putting this victim status on me that is so annoying. What do we do to allow others to actually claim their own story? When you see someone with with who's suffer, suffered from violence or suffering for, with a really devastating illness, how do we go about allowing their story to be and not put our own on them? Well, Lydia, one of the things about your TED Talk, that the word you kept using was reinvent, reinvent, reinvent. And I loved that because it wasn't just oh, no, you have the wrong story of me. Here's the one right story of Mm. me. It's this idea that we can continually add and reinvent this story of us, that we are greater than the content of our history and we are greater than the content of our experiences. And we can just kind of keep elaborating on that story. Mm. And so um, I would say that sort of one thing. And also just paying attention how you are speaking of yourself, Mm. you know, like, are you always saying, I'm Jenna, I'm a psychologist, or I'm a, I'm a depressive, or I'm a, yeah. and actually it's not just the quote unquote negative stories that I see as really problematic. I I see it as rigid stories. So uh, Mm. I know, I knew of this person who, she had this story I always look on the bright side. I'm always you know, I'm always optimistic. I'm always optimistic. Mm. And when she was a little kid, she was in this horrifically, horrifically abusive situation as a little kid. Mm. And so she developed the story. I always look on the bright side. I always look on the bright side. 
And because she always looked on the bright side, she couldn't see a situation where she needed to get out and get some help. Oh, fascinating. So it's it's even these kind of more positive <clears throat> stories, like women often have the story, well, I'm supposed to be nice. Mm. I'm a nice person. Mm. And then that can get us right. really trapped too. Mm-hmm. So it's about being able to sort of reinvent over and over again whatever story is most workable, whatever yep. lets you get to have the life you would most want to live. Mm. One of the really hard parts for me is there's a big emphasis right now on trauma-informed care. And I think it's so important for people to go back to those original traumas and to move through them and to understand what happened to be able to move forward. But there was a big emphasis on, you know, own what happened and own your illness. And so I was at a conference and this guy said, I really loved your book you wrote and I'm bipolar. And I said, are you? Because you seem like a beautiful human. (laughs) You just seem like you have like these gorgeous eyes and you have tons of empathy. Mm -hmm. And and I'm interested in that you would say, I'm bipolar. Mm -hmm. Like it's a diagnosis. It's not a human being. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if either of you could speak to that around, um, there is a way that trauma-informed care and, and people becoming their illnesses is also also not going to lead us out of this in terms of recreating new story. Do you have people come to your practice and say, I'm, I'm a depressive, I'm bipolar, I'm, I'm schizophrenic, I'm nothing else? Sure. Yeah. Of course, all yeah. the time. Mm-hmm. All the time. And, and whether we're talking about diagnosis or whether we're saying, you know, and I say the same thing, uh, Lydia, you were saying, I'm an introvert. Oh, I was yeah. just thinking that while she was talking. <laughs> and it's like, like oh, oh. Two, 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 two I point, do it all the time. 2.6 million <laughs> views in front of a huge audience. Here you are on the radio. You know, that. I will sometimes see somebody running down the road in the morning. I remember doing this a while back, years ago, and um, I thought, that's so cool. I just so admire that, but I'm not a runner. I was like, what? What the hell does that mean? Like, uh-huh. if I put on shoes and I started running, am I pretending? Oh, I'm a, I'm fake. I'm I run every morning, but I'm I'm just faking it because I'm not really a runner. And in some weird way, it's like we aren't just one story. Mm-hmm. We're all of our stories. Yeah. And in mm-hmm. another way, we're not any of our stories. Uh-huh. In yeah. a way, we're just the ones who live it, observe it, experience it, can continue to write new stories. Yeah, um, our stories or our labels are supposed to be shorthand descriptions. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like I'm mm-hmm. Brian and I'm a psychologist. That's just tells you what I do during my working hours, but they become prescriptive. Right. You know, more than agree. More mm-hmm. than they become just descriptive. And it's I think it's really funny how and it's just built into our language. Someone will say, So what do you do? I'm a mm-hmm. like I, that was a verb question. And yeah. we gave a noun answer. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. We we are the thing we do. No, I'm just, I'm, God, I'm just Brian. Mm-hmm. You know? Now, I practice psychology. I play some golf. Yeah. I eat plants. You know? And but now I'm you're a runner. A vegan, <laughs> and I'm a runner. <laughs> right? You had some really amazing ideas about some exercises people can do if they have begun to constrict their story or, or, or being too rigid about it. Would you? Share those, Jenna. I I mean, yeah. Sure. Should I call you Dr. Lejeune? Please don't. (laughs) Please do not. No. Um, Okay, Dr. Lejeune. Right. (laughs) Um, It was actually, when I was watching your TED Talk, Lydia, I thought, I mean, I got so excited when I was watching your TED Talk, and I got teary at the coffee shop, which is not unusual. Um, But um, because I thought of this exercise I do with my clients a lot and I have done it for myself as as well but it's called um, write the character of you um, so I get to work with some super cool creative artistic types of folks and so what I'll have them do is I'll say okay so here's your job you have to write screenplay pretend like you're char- um, developing this character for a screenplay or a novel or a short story and the character is you and every event of your life has to be exactly the same. But this character of you has no backstory that's already pre-written, doesn't have already any of these character kind of traits that you assign to you. You get to completely start fresh. Now, write what she would do in response to 
all of these events of your life. Mm-hmm. And then what's kind of cool, because the first time that it happens, like most people write the superhero version of that, which is awesome because we all have a superhero inside of us. But then when you have them go back and do it again and again and again, you can see, oh, I have a superhero in me. Mm-hmm. And I have somebody who's really scared and I have like the little kid that doesn't know what to do and I have the failure in me Mm. and all of those characters are within me. And again, it isn't about adopting a different story. It's about seeing, oh, I'm just telling a story about this character. Mm. Yeah, exactly. This, uh, it's so wonderful. I mean, the, the... Interesting thing for me is you come from a completely different practice. Your your practices are both completely full, and yet you both rely on story. Oh, absolutely, and writing so much. <laughs> absolutely, it's yep. it, it gives me hope for all of the people out there who are thinking, "Oh, I have something to say. I have something to write write down. I I have a character in me that I want people to know about." Oh, I think writing is essential or some form of expression. So I'll either have people write, sometimes people will paint their uh, characters yeah. of them. Um, they'll, you know, create poems, whatever it is. It's just being able to express the self. Mm-hmm. Actually, apparently we do the same thing. I think we do. I <laughs> yeah. Can I call myself a writer because you seem so much cooler than psychologists? <laughs> that's so, that's <laughs> so true. <laughs> What's your next project, Lydia? I'm. I have a toggle going on between a new novel, which is always incredibly daunting, uh-huh. and yeah, terrifying, and a new nonfiction book. Yeah. So there, and everything I've ever written has that toggle. There'll be a nonfiction version over here and a fiction version oh, over here, where I'm so literally cool. crossing the territory you're talking about. Yes. Um, wow. And it helps me write a less righteous and ego-based nonfiction story to be exploring different characters and how they move and where they succeed and where they mm. fail in the fiction. They they help me make better books in both categories. Wow. Mm. Wow. And do they come out at the same time? Generally? They don't come out on top of each other, but very near each other. You can track it. Uh, Smallbacks and chronology have a very intense, intimate relationship mm. with each wow. other. Wow. Although not everybody would see that uh, to me. Really it's really nice. clear. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Um, Brian, did you want to leave listeners with any any tips or exercises before we go? I think our, I think our play's pretty full. Yeah, me too. I just want to, uh, before we leave, Lady Gaga is such a, like, ah, oh, I feel about her like I do Lydia. Like I can't <laughs> even kind of be in the same room without hard some results. I just her artistry she's always been interested in people of diversity that she's always been Mm -hmm. interested in smashing all kinds of expectations of who women are supposed to be who genders are supposed to be and last night at the grammys god this speech i just want you to hear it i just want to say i'm so proud to be a part of a movie that addresses mental health issues They're so important. And a lot of artists, a lot of artists deal with that. And we gotta take care of each other. So if you see somebody that's hurting, don't look away. And if you're hurting, even though it might be hard, try to find that bravery within yourself to dive deep and go tell somebody and take them up in your head with you. I love you. Thank you so much to the Grammys. Thank you. That phrase, bring someone up into your head with you. I felt like what she was saying, she was giving us new language for when you're hurting, take someone along with you up into the place where you're hurting. That's your thoughts. Yeah. I want to leave you with that just because I thought it was so incredibly beautiful. And thank you, Lydia, so much for being with us again. What amazing people. Jenna and Brian, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.